well, for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, we have a very um, diverse, diverse uh, panel with uh, experts from all the three countries of South Caucasia, like Armenia, as we heard, Azerbaijan and Georgia. I would like to introduce shortly all the panelists by a question where they can position themselves a little bit. And I will start with Nino Sambakitze. I tell you, that's the biggest challenge to pronounce the names correctly. So I will stay with Nino, if you agree. She is chairwoman of the Georgian Farmers Association which is special, a woman being the chair, woman of Georgian Farmers Association. She is directing a milk processing enterprise with an impressive development, starting as a very small company. It became a large productive company. Nino, could you, as short as possible, Tell us about your success story, success story of the company, but also success, success story of a woman. Uh, thank you. I will take the opportunity to thank Swiss Development Corporation on behalf of Georgian farmers for the incredible jobs they're doing for uh, Georgian farmers. Um, before just starting uh, the story about me, it was coincident that I become a farmer. I started with uh, two cows. Uh, I used to live in the city center of, the, of Tbilisi, and then uh, later I moved to uh, region. Uh, we started with two cows, and later we have built up the dairy uh, factory, uh, engaging 350 farmers, because uh, Georgia is well known in uh, cattle breeding, and especially in my region. Uh, so right now we are working with 350 farmers in order uh, to buy from them uh, milk and generate uh, economic value for them. Uh, being as a uh, farmer, uh, I found out the problems what the f local farmers were facing and in 2012, uh, me with my friends who were just bit business-oriented farmers decided to create Georgian Farmers Association in order to help uh, farmers uh, for future development and plus at that time there was no fi farmers voice delivered to the government so mm, with my uh, let's say knowledge I'm trying to help them uh, besides that I become the farmer and I moved from city and also uh, me and my farmers are giving the good example not to migrate from the region so the young generation uh, we're motivating young generation to stay in the village and to uh, to you know develop uh, their region but also I want to add one thing that the farmers are not the farmers you uh, understand mostly 80% uh, of population is a peasant we are trying to call them farmers, but they are not. So not to mix the farmer with the peasant. So one, one sentence, what's the difference, or let's say the emotional difference between peasants and farmers? The uh, peasants are, are the self-sufficient uh, people who have 0 0.6 hectare in the less, so they produce for themselves. Uh, so farmers, we have much more business oriented who have a five hectare uh, of land and uh, more. So how many how many members do you have right now we have a 900 members all over the Georgia we have seven regions 360 villages we cannot cover all of them because uh, we're gonna be half country uh, but uh, we have mostly the uh, business oriented farmers but trying to help these small scale farmers to scale up and in what which way Switzerland was involved by your development? Uh, first is that the Swiss Development Corporation helps a lot of farmers in the, re uh, in the regions, mostly in uh, 
potato crops, uh, crops creation, creating value change and the cattle breeding. At the same time, uh, Swiss Development Corporation helps together with the UNDP for vocational education, uh, creation of vocation education uh, centers. So uh, that's how we've been linked because uh, it's the first time that the government listens to the farmers together with the donors, and we are the ones who are delivering the needs to, of the farmers to the uh, proper stakeholders. That's how I was connected with the Swiss Development okay. Corporation. Thank you. Um, the question of the woman um, hasn't been answered yet, but we'll come to this uh, later. Rudolf Schoch is the head of the Swiss Corporation program in the South Caucasus, including Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Tell me, you are now since three years in Tiflis, Georgia. How do you manage three countries being as different as we saw, as we heard? And how do you manage to know which program has to be effective in which region? Well, <clears throat> it's right. Uh, I think it has been mentioned, and it's mentioned time and again, that the South Caucasus region is very diverse. And that's right. We have three different countries. We have three different systems. In each of the countries' system that tries to address development in one or the other way. And in fact, when we look at the region, over the last 20 years, once they were united, in the former Soviet Union. Today, they are independent countries, and sometimes one thinks they are moving further apart from one another. And this is precisely one of the factors of the region and the commonalities. You have these two different sides. At the same time, I think that the region as such is an important factor that is going to design the future of these three countries. We have very powerful neighbors in the north, Russia, they just experienced the power now in some other parts close to Europe. We have another power in the south, Iran, we have Iraq, uh, we have Turkey as a third important power. In order to withstand this pressure and the interest of the neighbors, the future will rely somehow in common in incorporation that allows to represent the will of these three countries. Now within our program, we try actually to foster the cooperation of the three countries in many ways. We have across the region a common strategy that is composed of three different domains, economic development and employment as one. The second one is local governance and public services, and the third domain is uh, uh, human security. And as we heard, these are three key pillars in order, I think, to develop the region. We regularly have the people meeting with each other, looking at the project they are implementing and try to compare and learn from each other. So this allows to have contacts, to establish contacts, and at the same time, we try to link this experience afterwards with the three different government. So this is the way I think we try to address the regional aspect and giving a vision actually of cooperation in order to develop a better way towards development. May I ask one political question? We know that uh, those three countries not all of them really love each other. You uh, pointed out that uh, you want to have a cooperation. Is it understood by the relevant forces of those three countries? That's a very tricky question. <laughs> and it's quite difficult to, got to not to get on slippery ground on it. I think there are diverse interests in the country. In all the three countries, I think, there are very clear economic interests. And as in every country, there are certain people and certain groups of people they are representing 
these interests. At the same time, in all the three countries, we have a vast population which completely have been left out of development. We heard that a big majority of the people in Georgia still living at the existence level. You know, up to two years ago, with the new government, actually the rural area has been discovered, and new programs have been developed to link the rural people towards development, and that's why we are very grateful for these recent changes. But at the same time, we have in Armenia and well in the Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, in spite of the impressive growth, still high poverty in the rural area. The interest of the rural poor, as well as of the economic elite, which are grouped around selected families, is vast. And within our efforts, actually, to integrate the rural poor and other poor into the economy, we try to bridge the gap of interest. So, but this is not a very easy struggle, as you may understand, as interests are not easily given up or power positions are not given up, but the trend goes in the right direction. Thank you. Now I'll leave politics promised. I especially pose the question to you because you are the neutral Swiss. Um, Mr. Mikatic Aivazian, you are an expert for the rural Armenia. And although agriculture remains the major employment sector, poverty and unemployment, unemployment remain high, particularly in rural areas, also in Armenia. You are the project manager of the Sunik Livestock Project in Armenia. Can you explain us what the project is, where the difficulties are, and of course, how Switzerland is involved? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to take the chance and uh, say thank you to Swiss people uh, for the continuous support provided by Swiss development and cooperation on behalf of Armenian farmers. Uh, our project is working in the area uh, where climatic and geographical position do does not allow to do something else than animal husbandry. And uh, we talk about uh, some 30,000 rural uh, households uh, in over 40 villages. The project purpose is to increase farmers' income through uh, improved productivity and uh, systemic market changes. Uh, we work uh, through the whole value chains of meat and milk, uh, targeting areas like farmers' skill and knowledge improvement, uh, farm support services, affordability and accessibility improvement, uh, working with village munis municipalities uh, for uh, more efficient use of natural uh, and pasture resources villages have, and uh, last but not least, uh, uh, better access to uh, milk and meat markets. Uh, you have seen uh, the video on which uh, you, you could imagine a remote mountainous rural village where farmers have one to three cows uh, with uh, not knowing where to sell the milk or meat, with uh, no support functions and, and services available, such as veterinary or artificial insemination, and uh, again, the most important, no milk buyers coming to the village. So what the project does is uh, supporting farmers to improve their farming practices, uh, facilitating entrance of uh, farm support service providers such as community-based veterinary services, artificial insemination, input suppliers, uh, supporting the villagers to come together and set up a small meal collection point which makes the village interesting for buyers and uh, linking with uh, larger processing companies on a sustainable basis to come and pick up the milk and uh, what is uh, also important to pay in time. Uh, this is basically the project overview, and of course there are challenges, uh, amongst which, uh, first of all, uh, to change people's mindset. 
and uh, prove them that farming can be profitable, uh, especially if often that's the only source of income uh, they make for living, and uh, also to teach them uh, to pay for services they receive. Well, in Soviet times, uh, they didn't have to care where to sell milk produce. Uh, uh, they did not have to pay for veterinary, artificial, or, or other services. Right now, uh, we try to uh, move them from uh, subsistence farming, mentioned by my colleague, to more commercial operation. Uh, and these are the challenges we deal with, but uh, we also registered quite, quite a success. Uh, uh, incomes improved, uh, people, uh, I would say, woke up and uh, moved forward more optimistically. But how, I mean, you said you want to uh, change the mindset. Um, do you need Switzerland to change the mindset? Or wouldn't it be better that, I mean, really, yourself do it? Uh, absolutely, because uh, uh, the added value of, of uh, SDC support was, uh, first of all, in technical assistance approach, uh, which is about systemic market changes. What that means is uh, whatever intervention is done within the project is done in a way that uh, after a while, when the project exits, the change is there. Veterinary service established in the village uh, proves to be sustainable and we have a lot of examples uh, uh, with no project support anymore. The service is there, farmers are using that, it's increasing from year to year and uh, the same uh, examples can be brought with milk collection points and, and other markets. Okay, we come back to that later, hopefully. Uh, Mr. Steli, all what we heard um, needs training. And you are the expert in vocational training, I'd say. You are the head of teaching of the University of Applied Sciences School of Agric Agriculture, Forest and Food Sciences in Zollikofen, but you've been working all over the world. You have a broad uh, international experience in vocational trainings in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Where do you get in in South Caucasus? Where where do you have to um, work on, or what, what, what is your main intention? We are at the moment at the beginning, but in relation with your question, it's interesting to observe I had the privilege to work in the, during the last 15 years in quite a lot of countries you mentioned. And then often people ask me, but you are used to work here with farmers in Switzerland to deal with the Swiss uh, education system. How can you deal with uh, other education systems all over the world? And the interesting thing is that I observe and I live all over the world more or less the same questions and the same problems. Farmers, teachers, school directors, they ask, they discuss together with us the same question and what we try is to find adapted answer in relation to the different situation. And that's what we are doing at the moment. We are analyzing the situation in the different countries to see what could be the best education approach to um, support education in these three countries. Can you say already I spotted here uh, the most important um, point. Um, not only in relation with these three analyses, but in relation with my experience, I'm convinced that there will be four main elements, four main challenges that we have to attack. On the one hand, this will be the quality and uh, the content of the curricula, because it's always in relation with what kind of curricula do these different situations need. Then it's about the quality of teachers. We have to give a support and discuss together with them in which way they would try to further training their teachers. Then it's in relation with the quality of the teaching and learning process. We heard there are big farmers, small farmers, there are people with different uh, production styles, with different uh, products, 
And in this relation, probably we have to think about the way how learning process for these different situations would be useful. You, 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 you mentioned the teacher quality. You, you're talking about national teachers, not uh, Swiss teachers coming and, and teach there, but national teachers. Of course, of course. We are talking about uh, teachers working in vocational education and training within these countries. There are teachers, they have experiences, there are agricultural colleges, but the experience shows us that the, the work together with such teachers is very useful. They are open, they are interested to develop themselves, their competencies to work within these new structures. Okay. Thank you. Last but not least, um, I want to introduce Naila Safarova. She is Senior National Program Officer of the Swiss Corporation Office in Baku, Azerbaijan. We heard already uh, quite a lot about Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan, as we know, um, derives its revenues from oil and gas exports. Um, so how do you convince uh, people to stay in agriculture? if they can make probably much more money in gas and oil? Oh, that's, um, that's a good question. In fact, um, the overall mission and um, the overall challenge of our program, Swiss Development and Cooperation Program, is to diversify the, the oil-dependent economy of, of the Republic of Azerbaijan. With 1% of employment, it contributes to the half of the GDP and to the 90% of the export. While agriculture, in fact, employs 40% of the active population and, and probably 90% of the rural and regional population, but it contributes only 7% to the GDP generation and 6% and of the export. Well, we try to, to work on different elements in order, in order to diversify the economy. And there is a deep understanding in the government, but also in our program, that is clearly stipulated in our program, that oil revenues are finite. And there is a crucial need to diversify the economy, and the sustainable growth can be guaranteed, can be achieved only for diversification of the economy. That's why we work on the framework conditions, on the access to finance, on improving effectiveness and efficiency of the public services, and for working on these key elements, we clearly understand that agriculture was such an important contribution to the employment, to the food security, to the migration, to, to stop migration issues, but also to diversify economy, as mentioned earlier. We should probably focus more on this sector through different elements, mm -hmm. through different uh, reform measures, let's say. Now, we have a whole, um, uh, a lot of questions we could discuss, but I said in the beginning, since we have two women on uh, the panel, and the gender question is also a very important point at the development uh, programs of Switzerland, um, we have a chart um, showing that, hasn't been here yet, but maybe it will be here, um, showing that all the three uh, uh, countries on the gender equality index don't rank very high. Um, on the other hand, I see you two. Maybe, uh, Nina, you can uh, give us the answer. Um, why are you sitting here, but in the ranking, the gender question is a very big problem in South Caucasus? Uh, yes, I have to agree. Unfortunately, uh, it comes from the mentality. Uh, from the post-Soviet countries, I think uh, we were not equally treated. So now it's uh, changes in mentality that women started uh, active, uh, started you know acting more actively. Um, the thing is that uh, now even if you go through agricultural issues, you cannot find a lot of uh, women farmers. I mean. They do, they work, but they are not shown up. Uh, I was just uh, talking with the uh, deputy ministers that they, with the new government that they started the, you know, uh, giving the opportunity to farmers to take the low rate credit. Uh, be, uh, do, between the 14,000 people, you can only find 14 women 
who became bankable. So this is a problem that we are facing, and especially you know our farmers association. We really want to motivate uh, women, but uh, I think it has to be changes in mentality that people will start actively working. Okay, with. you want to motivate women. Where do you come in? Where can you um, influence this motivation, or do you do it with other instruments? Well, we are working through the value chain from the market down to the farmers. Now, when we look at many of the work that is being done, then at the end of the day, I think there's more than 50% of the work actually is done by women. When you travel across the country and you see the people working in the field, all those backs that are bended down to the soil are the backs of women. There is one standing straight up in general. This is the man who takes the responsibility and supervises. Now, when you ask afterwards for a training program and they just leave it open, then you will get all the men's that are the supervisors, but the real work is done by the others. So what we try to do now in our programs, that we shift actually the training to those people who do the real work. When you take the livestock value chain, so it's the woman that takes care of the cows, that's the woman who milks it, that's the woman finally who processes the milk and even brings it to the market. But how can you be sure that, yeah, please, Mr. Shelley can just support this, this idea saying that there are quite a lot of uh, um, examples doing such a shift. For example, using a quota to access the education system or also other um, ideas to not only motivate but really to influence the framework condition. And that would be, uh, I think, an important way to do it. Okay. Mr. Mikatic, is it... Um in your project, uh, do you uh, have women? Do you motivate them? Are they better in doing this mindset? You talked about it. In fact, uh, what we have done uh, in the project uh, was a specialized gender survey to understand the situation and adopt project interventions specifically to address the gender equality issue and to uh, assure that uh, the women are included in all economic opportunities the project provides. Mm -hmm. And uh, even more, uh, we have a limited group of women-headed households which uh, uh, get a bit more attention and effort from the project so that uh, to make sure that they are not uh, getting behind of whatever opportunities and economic uh, possibilities are there. Okay. Naila? Also, what is quite important, what we do, we try to increase leadership skills of the women. women. Across all our program, we, we try to improve their education in terms of the basic entrepreneurship skills that also facilitate, in fact, their access to finance. With the capacity building that we provide in, in cost optimization, cash management, business uh, management uh, aspects, the, the banks also, the financial sector also, the, uh, is, is, more, uh, is more willing to, to provide credit to women. This okay. is also the way how we do it. Before I continue, I want to tell that to the audience, if you have any questions, all of you have an iPhone, I guess, you can um, question or, or, or uh, yeah, pronounce your question by SMS 076. 333-2416, We won't have much time to answer them, but please uh, try, and we pick two or three, if possible, in the remaining time, until we have those questions. I want to go to another uh, topic, which is financing, because we've heard al already quite a lot about financing. I mean, all those shifts need a lot of investment, need a lot of um, money and especially the farmers to become entrepreneurs, as you said, need money. Is it easy to get um, the credit? Well, what is actually common in all the countries of the South Caucasus, this is affordability and availability of the financial services. 
And after the co-ops of the Soviet Union, there had been also co-ops of the certain sectors, including financial sector. Operational costs in all three countries are actually quite high. That also, uh, that also brings to the fact that interest rates are very high. Collaterals of the, of the farmers, they don't have very good access to the collateral. The, the land in some cases cannot be pledged. The, the financial sector is also a bit understandable because in fact they don't know very well the agricultural sector on one hand. On second hand, for them agriculture is extremely risky sector where everything is, is so dependent on the, on the harvest, on the climate, on the weather. Having very poor risk management techniques and skills Banks are quite, quite afraid to, to provide the, the, the credits, the financial services. Insurance sector is also quite rudimentary in our countries. And uh, I think that this, this all, fa all factors, in fact, uh, brings, brings to, the, to, the, to the case that, that it's quite expensive and, and uh, rather scarce. Nino and then Mr. Schoch. Facing the same problem with Azerbaijan does, and I think it's the same with Armenia, that uh, Especially women, they are not bankable and agriculture fully because uh, all uh, banks are considering it uh, as a high risk and there is no education because still we are missing uh, a lot of uh, educational issue in the agriculture. But in our case, we had a huge support from new government. Uh, so the people, they got opportunity to get uh, low rated credit, rate credit because uh, like two years ago it was 30 to 36 percent per year and now you can easily find the business oriented farmers who are getting a three percent loan and be, before it was started uh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken and Mr. Rudy can uh, add more uh, it was the Swiss Development Corporation helping the farmers uh, you know not only with the grant issue but the uh, same with the low rate credit as far as I remember so I can you can add, uh, add more so now it's much more uh, possible than it was before but still we are missing uh, you know funds in order agriculture to develop mm -hmm. how do you intervene yes i think providing financial products to the small and medium farmers are key for the development of it we have been very strong in the past in fixing the value chain from the farmer to the market, or the market to the farmers, including the service providers. Now, very recently, we started to focus on the finance sector. And there again, we try to facilitate the process that takes us out of the system at the end of the day that it can go on. When we look at the small farmers, as it has been mentioned, they don't have collaterals, they are accepted by the banks. And this is understandable a thin cow or a poor household, the little land has no value against the money to be given by the bank. What we do now is we started to introduce the value chain financing. That means the collateral is not, are not physical assets anymore, but the system that guarantees afterwards the bank that they get the money back. This is one key element in it. The second, what we are working on, is uh, agro-insurance or micro-insurance. We heard about the weather, there are regularly hailstorms, there are floods, there are other things which endangers the, the harvest of the farmer. So by introducing microcredit, again, the risk is substantially reduced. Thirdly, of course, the banks at this point of time, it has been mentioned, needs to be trained on these products to bring them closer to the small farmer and understand their problem in order to accurately assess the risk of it. With these different test systems, we hope, and we haven't the result yet, but we are working very closely with the biggest bank of Georgia, and it's a pilot project we started in Georgia, with the Bank of Georgia to introduce this system, and if it works, we're going to roll it out. Mr. Mikotic. Uh, just, just in addition to value chain uh, there are often situations when uh, the banks uh, are simply not needed. So we try to explore uh, when the buyer and the farmer can use direct 
uh, outgrowing or contract farming schemes. So these tools are also uh, will be uh, will also be applied and then promoted. Okay. I'm very afraid we are already uh, short on time, so I want to ask one final question to all of you. If you have one thing you could change very fast, what would be the most important thing? Mr. Schoch? Well, a difficult question because there's so many problems and <laughs> to set priorities towards it so it's always a kind of a package because we work in systems what is important I think what we can change quite quickly is to identify in the value chain the very critical element and fix that because any value chain is as strong as its weakest individual element. So it's more an approach that we have to do. Now, within that, in a midterm perspective, is the vocational training. And we are working in all the three countries on it, and I think it will contribute beyond, actually, the financial aspect substantially to improvement of agriculture production as well as inclusive growth in all the three countries. Thank you. Ayla? No, I think that the most uh, important is actually the knowledge, mindset, culture. We should, we should try. There, there is no fast and easy solution, but, uh, but in the wishful thinking, probably the most important is with preserving the traditions and, and culture of the nation to change uh, attitude towards agriculture, but towards entrepreneurship in all three countries of the South Caucasus. When SMEs, regardless of the sector, is, is more looking towards the center, to, towards the, the state, the government, that it would support them in financing, in knowledge, and, and in, in many other um, uh, things. So I think that the, the most important is in fact uh, capacity and, and institutional building, knowledge, mindset, culture. Thank you. Mr. Steiner? Uh, if I could uh, change something, then it would be, of course, as it was mentioned before, uh, the education system in the sense that I would try to collaborate together with all the actors in the direction of a dual system. It does not mean that we take the Swiss system and introduce it there because as it is for all the, the problems, we cannot work in a, in a vacuum. There are situations, there are already teachers, there are directors, but together with them, I think, um, dealing as a, as a team together, it would be possible to introduce interesting elements out of an experience that we have with quite a lot of uh, long success story. Actually, I mean, the tertian sector is uh, increasing rapidly while the farmer sector go, or the agriculture sector rather goes down. So you have a lot of work. How can you persuade the youth, especially, to make this decision not to go into the tertiary sector, the tertiary sector, but into vocational training. This is in relation with quite a lot of points, but I will mention three. The first one is that we should offer, or the, the government of these countries should offer a sound uh, framework condition with rules, with uh, legal conditions, so that uh, the people who follow this education know what they will have at the end. The second point would be uh, common development of the contents of the curricula. And the third thing that we, we should take in account is the idea that um, the, the programs should be quite different in relation to different task, um, task groups. Okay. So that it's not only one program, but different programs which lead to, diff, uh, which helps to fulfill different needs. Thank you. Uh, Nino, before you um, answer uh, or pronounce your wish, there was one question, maybe this is your wish. What's the average milk production of cows in Georgia? 
In Switzerland, it's 6,600 kilograms per year. Maybe this is your wish, that milk production is increasing. Yes, <laughs> it is absolutely, because um, it's even a shame to say that what our cows are delivering, it's like around 2,000 liters per year. We have like cows who are giving three or four liters per day. We, are, we have a goat, not cows. Let me say that one. <laughs> so uh, the, the wish, you know, in Georgian reality, is very hard to say one wish in agriculture, but I, pre I would prefer to make stronger private sector in order to attach farmers to them because it will take a lot of years in order the farmers to become, you know, more stronger and to scale them up. But for, for the first step, I would create, you know, some uh, factories. So in that case, the farmers could generate the income and the private sector would okay. become stronger. So you fit very well with uh, Mr. Stelle. So hopefully you work together in the next years. <laughs> yes. Make it. Uh, well, the situation with cows is no better in Armenia. And if, if quickly to change, I would wish to change the total breed of Armenian cows with these productive <laughs> ones. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for this short uh, panel, but uh, maybe we have...